Hi, welcome to Contempo. I am your host, Roberta Mark Bright. Thank you so much for being with us and for sharing with us. Please help me welcome our very special guest, author Julia Rath, who has written her own personal story and her scientific research about having sleep apnea. Welcome, Julia. Thank you, Bobby. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, it's a joy, and we've wanted to do this for a long time. I have yes. to share this with others. I love what you wrote. Uh, you gave me this bu your book, mm -hmm. and you wrote an adorable uh, signature to Bobby and Jerry. I hope this book doesn't put you to sleep. Yes. All the best. And Julie, it's part of your personality. You have a very wonderful attitude. It's very special because you wrote this very wonderful book that is so thorough from, in the beginning, your own personal perspective. And I think people will be drawn to read that because of that. Uh, tell us a little bit about your story, about your own. Okay, um, basically, um, I started noticing I had a problem when I was sleeping in the, about 2000, in the year 2000. And it was just a, a random sort of thing. I'd gone on vacation, I was in a hotel room in Ohio, and I started noticing I was having problems with my breathing while I was asleep. And I thought, well, you know, it's a hotel room, maybe it's a chemical they're using, maybe it's an unfamiliar surroundings, a different bed. I'll go home, I'll be fine. Well, suddenly, a uh, short time afterwards, I'm noticing the same problem also occurring in my familiar surroundings at home. And I'm beginning to realize there's something wrong, something deeper than that, and that I have something like that was probably sleep apnea. I wasn't sure. All I knew was that I wasn't rested when I'd wake up in the morning, and I felt lousy all night, and I kind of suspected my breathing wasn't good, but I didn't know. So at some point, I said, okay, what has changed in my life? What have I done differently? I went to the doctor at one point, and I said to the doctor, I think I might have sleep apnea. And the doctor said, there's no way you have sleep apnea. You're too young, uh, you're the wrong gender, and you don't weigh enough. And I said, but, but I'm sick, I'm, I'm not well, I used to feel good, but you know, the doctor ignored me. And then I said to myself, you know, Julie, you have a PhD in sociology, you know how to do research, forget what the medical profession is saying, I'm going to figure it out for myself, I'm going to figure out why I'm feeling so sick. So that's what I started to do. I started to think about it for a while and I said, well, what have I done differently between now and then, assuming that that is a change in my environment for a moment, let's assume that. I said, well, it's either food or it's something in the uh, air or something that I'm breathing in. Okay, so I sat down, thought about it, and I said to myself, all right, if, let's say it's food. Let's come out with an, what I call, uh, other people have called an elimination diet. Let's see if I'm allergic to a particular thing. And at that point, and even now, that is not considered typical for sleep apnea. Doctors don't look at apnea as being caused by an allergy. They just do not. It's still in the, they don't know what causes it. But I thought to myself, uh, I think it was Lao Tse in, in ancient China said, you know, if you think you're ill, turn to the diet first. So I started to turn to the diet and I started cutting out things and by golly, I started noticing what was causing my sleep apnea, or at least for me. Mm -hmm. I can't speak about other people. I can't speak about their own sensitivities or their own allergies. I can only talk about myself. And in my case, the very first thing I discovered that was a problem at that time was chicken. And I'm like, and chicken, I, I ate chicken since I was a child, since I was a little girl, and I loved chicken. I ate it all the time. How could it be chicken? At first, I thought it was the marinade. I thought it was maybe uh, something accompanying the chicken, something I ate with it, maybe the, at that point the cooking oil, maybe the way it was prepared. But eventually, after eliminating all these possibilities, it was the chicken. And as I shared with you earlier, I discovered, I started doing some research on the internet, armchair research, and I realized they're putting arsenic in chickens. They were putting it into the antibiotics to make the chickens grow larger and faster, to give them bigger breasts so that there's more white meat in them, because that, you know, a lot of restaurants and a lot of people like white meat chicken. And so uh, I realized that once I cut out the chicken from my diet, by golly, my apnea seemed to have gone away. That's how the whole thing started and why I started thinking that maybe it wasn't just the chicken, it could be other foods as well. 
And then over time, I should just add this too, they have, I, and for the listening audience, they have pulled the arsenic out of the chicken. Why do you, uh, do you think it was publicity that they finally noticed that they shouldn't do that, whoever the powers that be are? No, they started doing research on it. Oh. There was, it was a particular chemical called 3-nitro, um, otherwise known as roxersome, and it was being given to chickens worldwide. It wasn't just in the United States. What they would do is they'd take the chickens and they'd pack them in hen houses, lots of chickens per square inch, also could be called like a concentration camp, I yeah. hate to say, for chickens. Terrible. They couldn't flap their wings. And of course, they get sick. No scratching posts, no, no way of escaping. They would get, and they get sick and they, the other birds would catch it. And so they would give these antibiotics to the chickens in order to prevent the diseases from spreading. And it would wind up in the chicken meat. And therefore, with enough of it, people would ingest it. And as a result, someone like me, with my super sensitivities to lots of things, I was one of these people who got sick with, in my case, sleep apnea from eating it. And, and you love chicken, and you still do. Mm -hmm. uh, when did they stop putting the arsenic in? Would that was, I think, about 2009. What happened is they started doing some scientific research, and they had, I, I'm trying to remember how it goes. I think it was the um, organic arsenic, they were looking for it to turn into inorganic arsenic, or I might have it confused, it's one or the other. And they said at one time there weren't enough parts per million that it was going to harm human health. But then they oh. redid their research, they started studying it more, and they found out, yes, in fact, it can harm people. And they, they, at that point, they were even looking at water from the hen houses that had like 40 times the amount of arsenic that should be in normal drinking water. And the chickens were, ta were in, ingesting, in, it. ingesting it, and then the water was coming out. And, and as I told you earlier, you know, they build, have rice patties with a lot of this water in a lot of countries, and the rice would get the arsenic in it. Um, so it was really bad and they finally pulled it out. It took about a year and then the, once the arsenic was out of the food supply, after that time period, I could eat chicken again. Well, I was going to, th the happy result is that now you're eating chicken again. Yes. I would imagine that a lot of people have experienced what you have, the frustration of a physician not really recognizing this uh, and it's really sad. Have you heard other people respond to you, either through your book or your talks, that they've had the same experience? I had a friend who I actually, before I had finished composing the book, I was telling her some of these things I had found and had recommended that she pull certain things out of her diet. And she made the comment to me that she felt a lot better. At that time, it was chicken. But there are other foods as well. I'm, I, what I'd like to say is when, when it's the diet, I don't just mean chicken. Uh, there are many foods in this day and age that have chemicals in them that can possibly affect your breathing. During the day, you might be fine. It's at night when you lie horizontal, that's when it comes mm. up. And one of the things I should mention uh, as another example, it's a chemical called uh, propylene oxide. And you'd say, well, where is that chemical come from and what does it do? Well, one example is I noticed that I used to be able to eat peanuts. I'm not allergic to peanuts. I could eat peanuts, peanut butter, I was fine. And from like one minute to the next, I suddenly couldn't eat peanuts. And I'm thinking, I'm not allergic to them. And it was like that with almonds too. I love almonds. And I suddenly couldn't eat them. So I remember writing a list when I was doing this whole elimination diet. Okay, peanuts, almonds, and then strawberries, uh, conventionally grown strawberries from California. I can't eat them either. What? And then when I started looking at the connections, all of them use propylene oxide in the fields to kill off the salmonella and the bugs. Oh. And therefore, it's supposed to be when you eat it, the propylene oxide turns into something called propylene glycol, and it's supposed to be generally regarded as harmless. Um, but it's not for someone, again, sensitive like me. I was getting the apnea. And I should just add that the farm workers who go and, and are around these crops, they can get sick from some of these sprays as well. Do, do you think it's almost um, a burden to be the only one or to be in a minority? Uh, because you are very sensitive to these things. I, I think part of it is it is a burden because 
people first thing think you're a little too overly crazy, a little overly sensitive. That's too bad. Oh yeah, why don't you just go ahead and eat this? You'll be fine. Well, it's not a matter of eating it or not eating it. And I'm feeling sorry right now for the children who are told that they should go ahead and eat the peanut butter and just gradually, if you add a little more in their diet, they'll be okay. I'm very sorry about it because, again, they may not be allergic to the peanuts, just like I wasn't. Mm -hmm. They may be allergic to the chemicals on the peanuts. And so therefore, by eating something they shouldn't be eating, they are getting more of these poisons in their system. It's so complicated. There are also products uh, for the household. Mm -hmm. What about those? Okay, what I say in the book is, whereas that may not necessarily be a cause of sleep apnea, and again, it's a one, uh, N equals one. It's anecdotal, it's my story. Whereas I, the food I can definitely throw, you know, one-to-one -one correspondence is eating it and then getting sick. The chemicals are more a contributing factor. So therefore, I may not necessarily get apnea from certain aerosol sprays or certain chemicals like bleach and so forth may not cause apnea, but they do impair your breathing. It makes your apnea worse or makes you more susceptible to getting the apnea. I see. Now you have a, a chapter called Some Characteristics of My Obstructive Sleep Apnea Versus My Central Sleep Apnea. What is the difference? Okay. Uh, first of all, as I as I had said before, sleep apnea has to do with uh, not being able to breathe at night. Uh, there are two main kinds. One is obstructive and one is central. And the difference is this. Obstructive sleep apnea is basically you're choking either way. You're not breathing. But it's more... I write it's caused by inflammation. You're eating certain foods that cause inflammation, that causes the obstruction, and then therefore causes the choking. That's obstructive, and most people with sleep apnea have obstructive sleep apnea. Central sleep apnea, on the other hand, it's, a, it's something in the brain that tells your body not to take a breath. And as a result of that, that's what causes the apnea. So you choke after your brain tells you don't breathe. Are you born with that affliction, no. if you will? No. Uh, well, I can't say that. I haven't done a, a sample of a thousand patients to find that out. Sure. But I will say that different foods, in my case, cause different reactions. So certain foods cause the obstructive sleep apnea, in my case. Mm -hmm. so going back to this, what I had said before about chicken, that was the obstructive chi uh, sleep apnea. Peanuts were also obstructive sleep apnea. Now, the um, central sleep apnea were, were different foods. Yes. So certain types of, back to the almonds again, you'd think it would be the same mechanism, but for some reason it was more, uh, it manifested itself differently. Well, it's so complicated today because chemicals are in everything. That's right. But the household items, is the fact that you can breathe in these chemicals, is that what can cause sleep apnea? Okay. Um, it, it is definitely a contributing factor. It certainly is a contributor to other things, possibly chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, other sorts of problems breathing. It, it does not help an individual who has breathing problems to mm. be around smoke, pet dander, um, also, and then of course artificial chemicals and so sprays, fa fragrances, things that make things smell good, you know, uh, you know, air fresheners, spray on deodorants. I mean, if you have a choice in the matter, Don't. use use a roll-on with, uh, you know, without all the harmful chemicals in it. Uh, use use cleaning products like um, I won't give any names, products, right? But you know, something that doesn't say lingering fragrance. There is one company that says lingering. Do not use anything that says lingering fragrance. You want something that when you put the any kind of fragrance, either fragrance free or as close to the ground as possible so it doesn't come up in the air and you don't breathe it at night. You had a very interesting experience when you started noticing your sleep apnea. You were half awake and half asleep and I don't know is that called hypnagogy? Yes, hypnagogic state, correct. I, I, is this unusual that a person would watch, them, uh, watch themselves supposedly in their sleep struggling with sleep apnea, which is what you did. You were really watching yourself suffering. That's true. That's very true. I was watching myself suffering. 
I will say this, since I was a small child, I've always noticed that I was a very light sleeper. It's just something that's in my makeup. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to say that the vast majority of people with sleep apnea sleep through their apneas. They don't realize that they're having the problem. Or once in a great while, they might wake up in like a panic attack, mm -hmm. kind of a bit like post-traumatic stress, you know, anxiety disorder and all that, but they don't know why they suddenly woke up from their sleep in the way that they did. So in my case, as sensitive as I am, I was able to be in that state yeah. between wakefulness and sleeping, sleepiness. And usually it was right before, right when I was lying in bed trying to fall asleep, that's the moment that I could hear the apneas. Oh. I could actually hear it and I could feel it in my, in my throat and sinuses. Were you and terrified? Definitely, it's very scary yes. when you have uh, one of these episodes and you stop breathing. It, it's, 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 it yeah. makes you panic, you, you go crazy. There were some moments that were horrible in the middle of the night where I was like, how am I gonna restore my breathing? I can't, I mean, I couldn't even call 911 and I discovered at least for myself, if I put my head down to the floor as far down as possible, that I could start to regain really? my breathing. Well, one day I did that intentionally. I ate, back to the chicken analogy again, I ate too much chicken intentionally to test out my theory. And then that was one of the nights that I woke up and I couldn't oh. breathe at all. And it was, it was horrible. So you did do that exercise and it yeah. worked. I had, to, I had to do something to get my breathing back, yes. Terrifying. What is CPAC, C-P-A-C? No, it's C-P-A-P. -P. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. It is the most common device that is used for people with sleep apnea. And the reason that the doctors use it is that it pumps air into the body, into the lungs, so that you can breathe during the night, so that you have a clear channel of air again, so that you breathe and you stay alive. Now, the problem, there are many problems with a CPAP machine, and one of which is that it's noisy, it can be yeah. uncomfortable. Uh, they've gotten smaller. They used to be a huge thing about the size of you know, this table and you know, giant thing that would take up an airline seat. Uh, it was huge. Oh. Now they're down to about the size of an old-fashioned tape recorder. Uh, they're, they're much smaller, they're much lighter, uh, and they also have, um, CPAP is usually associated with wearing a, a, a full mask on your face. Uh, these days, they've cut it down. Some of them have a little half mask, mm -hmm. and some, some of them just where your, where your nostrils are. And again, it has that same function, and it's the doctor who decides which type of CPAP is most appropriate for your particular type of apnea. And I'll add one more thing. One reason the doctors like the CPAP machine is it works in both cases, obstructive sleep oh. apnea and central sleep apnea. And it, it relieves them at some level of the burden of figuring out why do patients have one or the other. If you give them a treatment <laughs> where it solves both problems, you don't have to investigate much further. Oh, it's, it's a general treatment yes. then. Yes, yes. Have there been statistics done on the majority or the minority of people who like this so-called cure, which well, it isn't, but... The doctors call it the so-called gold standard of treatment mm. because it seems to work in most cases. But the problem is whether the patient can tolerate it. You have to lie in a certain position. I mean, for example, myself, I tend to lie on my stomach when I'm sleeping. And if you're wearing a mask, you can't do that. <laughs> you have to be on your side or your back. Yeah. So, so it's inconvenient. Uh, the, basically, a lot of people uh, will get it. A, a few people that I've met, because I've talked to a lot of people, a few people respond to it and they're OK. They don't love it by any means, but they feel better. But the vast majority say, oh, that darn thing, I used it for a short time, and I'm glad to be rid of it. I couldn't use it. I couldn't stand it. Uh, so it's, it's generally not the preferred yeah. thing for patients. Now, what about being moody the next day after you have an attack during the night? Uh, are people who suffer that way, are they aware of the connection, would you think? I'm not sure if they are aware of the connection, they may realize that something's not right with them. I mean, we're looking at episodes of road rage that are happening in our culture, and you wonder, why are these people having this problem behind the wheel? 
You know, why are students dropping off or dropping off, drifting off in school mm -hmm. or on the job? Why are they sleeping in their classes? Well, some of it may not be necessarily intentional or they're not aware of it. Some of it could be uh, effects of sleep apnea that is undiagnosed. And in fact, I should add, most sleep apnea is not diagnosed. Um, because patients don't usually go to their doctor and say, like I did, I have sleep apnea. Usually they think they, they're supposed to feel this way. Oh, I didn't sleep that well last night. Oh, big deal. It's not that bad and, and all that. Or they think it's normal. And it's actually, it's not normal. Well, how frustrating, again, to have a doctor tell you that you don't have it, but you know you do. Uh, are there more and more of you, would you say, who are fighting back and asserting themselves and trying to find out by their own personal studies what's happening to them. Have you talked to a lot of people like yourself? Well, I've talked to a lot of people. I don't know necessarily about sleep apnea, but patients are definitely trying to empower themselves more when they go to the physician's offices mm -hmm. with more prepared questions. Because I, I hate to say it in this day and age, with you know time of a physician being very rare, and with insurance costs and all that, it's kind of difficult for patients to get in exactly what they want to say to the doctor. So it's always good to come prepared with a list of questions in advance and say, I've been having this and this and this problem. So at least you can maximize the doctor's time when, they're, when you're in the office with them. Again, frustrating. Yes, of course. Um, well, the moodiness, does that affect, that must affect people on the job. And one other thing. What about the rampant, and this is not statistical or professional, but the shootings that we read about every day now, um, th could that possibly, in your estimation, be a problem? I would say this. I'm not sure that uh, this is because people are uh, not getting enough sleep, but certainly there could be a chemical imbalance from certain foods these people are eating. Mm -hmm. uh, if you eat, uh, if you live your life on junk food, you will get very ill. I remember giving a talk on sleep apnea once and being kind of hyper and excited, and I was done with the talk and I was, you know, feeling like invulnerable. So I ran off to a restaurant I normally don't eat at because I know I'm allergic to the food. And I said, oh, I feel so great. Nothing is going to hurt me. Well, by golly, I went to this particular fast food chain and I oh. was sick for the next three or four days because you know you don't know if it's the soybean products they put in the hamburger. As I was saying before, uh, soybean oil, canola oil, corn oil, most of these things are genetically modified these days in the United States. They use this to fry our foods. They use this on french fries. They use it in a lot of fast food chains, use a lot of these types of uh, chemicals in that are you know um, GMOs, which are genetically modified organisms. Um, and the problem with eating these kind of cooking oils is that it can actually make you very, very sick. Well, canola oil is really rampant in this country. What are genetically modified substances? Well, uh, genetically modified substances are literally where they take, they change the chemical nature of the plant, or I should say the biological nature. They insert genes into oh. the different types of DNA that the plant has, and then it grows. Uh, usually it's companies like hey, Monsanto, Cargill, all these different seed producing companies, and the seed becomes uh, proprietary to those companies, and the farmers plant it. And as a result of planting these kinds of patented seeds, they get the crops, and a lot of these crops are money makers for the com companies that make them. They, they may have certain advantages. Some of them may use less water. Some come to market sooner. There, there could be all sorts of initial advantages. But the problem is a lot of them have not been tested on human beings mm -hmm. and how we are affected by them. So some of these, generally these cooking oils, can really affect you a lot. And they've affected me tremendously. They have. Um what are the other oils that are used in frying and... Um, I tend to go for sunflower oil. I have no problems with that. Safflower oil, some people do, but again, this is personal. I have no problem. Organic canola, organic soybean, organic corn, all those are fine. If it says it's an organic kind of oil, I have no problem with it. My body digests it just fine. It's the common ones now. The United States and Canada grow a lot of rape seeds, which is what makes canola oil. And it's like, so it's about 90% of the oil, the canola oil is all uh, with genetically modified. And it, it can make people really, really sick. Well, do they 
uh, rapeseed, which we saw in France a lot, do they put chemicals in them also while they're uh, in the rapeseed? Okay. While we have to make a distinction between organic, uh, which means they cannot put any kind of fertilizers or weed killers or pesticides mm -hmm. in it, as well as the fact that it's not genetically modified, versus the fact that it could be genetically modified, but still they don't put the chemicals, the weed killers and so forth, or the reverse, that it could be a conventional crop. But, it, but then they don't put the chemicals. I mean, it's, there's all sorts of combinations depending on farming practices. Well, you know, it's almost sad that it's so complicated that you have to really dig and dig and dig like you have done and probably are still doing. What has this done for you? Uh, it must be a wonderful sense of accomplishment to have written this book and to, I know you've had one or two book signings, and I'm sure it's been very effective to the people who have come. Well, actually, it's not so much the accomplishment of writing the book, but it's more the accomplishment of getting my life back. Because oh. I couldn't breathe, I couldn't think during the day. And I mean, I hate to say it, when you get all these scary events of you know not being able to breathe during the night and you wake up like traumatized, it, it's you feel like you want to die. You really do. I believe and, it. and I think about Michael Jackson. I know it's a very weird thing to talk about in this context. Sorry. Michael Jackson, they, you know, he, unfortunately he was killed. He had that propofol with, uh, you know, the, the doctor gave him too much. But the question is, why was he not sleeping? So one day I was watching a, a, a show where they had a perspective, prospective on Michael Jackson's life. They went back and they showed his, and he was telling somebody, oh, these are delicious, have these almonds. And I looked and I'm like, oh my God, if I ate that many almonds, I would be as sick as Michael Jackson was. So what I'm trying to say is that even some of our top stars are not immune to these problems and they don't know the underlying mechanism. He was probably hurting his body by eating all those almonds and he didn't know it. Well, you know, they're people just like us, you know, only they're stars. So they're going to have the same problems we do. Yes, you know? absolutely. What are your future goals, if you will? I mean, this was a big undertaking and it's been very successful. Uh, what, what do you plan to do beyond well, this? Well, okay, first of all, I plan to write a sequel to this book. And um, a lot of the information in this book, while it's, again, my own experiences, plus a lot of armchair research, things change in the intervening time period. I finished the book, it came out in July of 2013, and now I can write, I, the, the medical profession has moved a little closer in my direction. It's not there yet, but- um, It's so a I, start. It's a start, it's moving that way. People are also more aware of the foods they eat. There's a lot more stuff labeled organic. You'll notice there are a lot, number of companies that are trying to pull out the, the GMOs from the foods in, in, you know, in some of these restaurants. So it, there is progress in that direction, but I would argue there's not enough. So one of my goals is to write a sequel to the book uh, more of what you should or shouldn't eat and what you should take a look at. And then more generally speaking, um, I have a lot of other you know, fish to fry, as they say, but of course not in uh, canola or soybean uh, oil. Other things. <laughs> um, what is your website? My <laughs> website is www.conqueropnea.com and conquer apnea is one word. Uh, of no spaces, no and, spaces and no capital letters. No, has this given you more strength or more determination to keep going? Evidently it has, because you said you're gonna write a sequel. And it seems from what you've already written, there couldn't be any more, but you have said there have been changes, positive changes. There have been positive changes, but also there's certain additional foods you always have to look out for. Because, you know, maybe, as I said once before about the chicken, okay, there could be some new item that you now have to look at because maybe there wasn't the chemical last year, but this year, like potatoes. Potatoes seem to be harmless and they're okay. We have to say goodbye. We okay. Can, we could go on forever. That's right. Julie, thank you so much for being here. And when you're on your way to your next uh, tome.